Welcome to the Heritage Foundation, um, where we are going to look at some Arctic issues today. Um, the name of our program is Examining Arctic Opportunities and Capabilities. Does the U.S. have the infrastructure, ships, and equipment required? Um, before we get started, let me introduce myself. I'm Jack Spencer. I'm the Vice President for our Institute for Economic Freedom and Opportunity. Now, I know on the the invitation. You, you were promised uh, James Carafano, who is probably more qualified than I to do this. Unfortunately, he got stuck um, with some travel difficulties, so you get me. Um, now, while I am the vice president of our economic shop here at the Heritage Foundation, I used to dabble in national security um, related issues, which I think are, 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 are relevant here, here at Heritage um, many years ago. So, uh, so we have that at least. Um, this is a really critical issue. Um, it's one that Dr. Carafano, if he were here um, five years ago, he would have said how important this issue was. And a lot of us here at the Heritage Foundation would have said, yeah, Jim, yeah, it's important, whatever, you go on and keep saying that. But since he started that, um, that argument, they, we've been on a clear trajectory um, where it became very clear how important this issue was, how important the Arctic region was, and how important the United States policy regarding the Arctic region is. And it's important for three, real re three specific reasons, um, at least three. There are real environmental issues that um, either we need to deal with or that as uh, that region gets developed, we're going to have to deal with. There are real economics issues. Um, there are folks up there who, uh, who want to increase their standard of living, who want to develop their, uh, where they live, develop their economy. And there are real security issues. That's the one I think probably most people think of, first and foremost, who aren't actually living in the Arctic. And, um, and I would just suggest that if, um, if the United States does not uh, participate in Arctic policy, doesn't come up with a coherent, um, rational policy toward the Arctic, others will. And perhaps we will find that um, we're not as happy with how others engage that region as what, um, as what we would have. So that's why um, I'm so honored and happy today, uh, and privileged really, to introduce the, our, our, our speaker. Our speaker is Admiral Robert Papp. He um, is the Special Representative for the Arctic. Admiral Papp became the State Department Special Representative for the Arctic in July of 2014 and will lead the effort to advance U.S. interests in the Arctic region with a focus on Arctic Ocean governance, climate change, economic, environmental, and security issues in the Arctic region as the United States prepares to assume the chairmanship of the Arctic Council in 2015. Prior to his appointment, Admiral Papp served as the 24th Commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard and led the largest component of the Department of Homeland, Homeland Security. As a flag officer, Admiral Papp served as Commander, Coast Guard Atlantic Area, as the Chief of Staff of the Coast Guard and Commanding Officer of Coast Guard Headquarters, as Commander, 9th, 9th Coast Guard District, and as Director of Reserve and Training. Admiral Papp was a career cutterman, having served in six Coast Guard cutters, commanding four of them, Red Beach, Paw Paw, Forward, and the Training Bark Eagle. He is a 1975 graduate of the United States Coast Guard Academy. Additionally, he holds a Master's of Arts in National Security and Strategic Studies from the United States Naval War College and a Master's in Science in Management from the Salva Regina College. Admiral Papp, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Jack. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's a delight to see the crowd here today. Uh, believe me, as I've spoken about the Arctic over the last year in this job, sometimes I speak to about half dozen people, sometimes I speak to a couple hundred. Uh, actually, uh, in uh, Ambassador Hardy, how many did we have at, uh, at uh, Arctic Circle in, in Reykjavik? I think 1,300 from, a, from about 35 different countries. So it varies, uh, but I take every opportunity I can because Jack was absolutely right. This is a very important issue. It's a very important issue for our country, first and foremost, because we are chairing the Arctic Council right now. Uh, but there will be more and more responsibilities for our country as the Arctic continues to develop. And uh, I, as I said, part of, uh, part of my job is to raise awareness of the Arctic and some of the challenges that we're facing. So I'd like to start off by telling people, how does one become the United States Special Representative for the Arctic? 
I think it's very easy to track that back because we've only had one, so obviously there's only one answer. Uh, first and foremost, you have to be very careful on how you select your assignment leaving the Coast Guard Academy. Uh, back in 1975, uh, I was engaged, and I thought that I would probably select an assignment either in Boston or New York because my wife's parents live in between in New London, Connecticut. Uh, when I got into the actual night where we picked our assignments, uh, by chance I walked in there and there was a ship that was remaining in Alaska that was available. And on a spur of the moment, I said, that sounds exciting. That sounds like an adventure. Alaska, the last frontier. And I looked and it was the Coast Guard Cutter Ironwood home ported in a place called Adak, Alaska. I said, well, I don't know where ADAC is, but it's Alaska. It's got to be great, and it's going to be an adventure. So I put my card in the slot and went back to my room and broke out an atlas. Now, I challenge any of you to do this. Get an atlas of the United States and turn to the Alaska page. And on the Alaska page, you'll see mainland Alaska. You might, in the lower left-hand corner, see a little bit of the Alaskan Peninsula. And then there's a couple of inserts at the bottom. The first insert has the remainder of the Alaskan Peninsula and maybe two or three hundred miles of the Aleutian Islands. The second insert has the remaining portion of the Aleutian Islands and ADAC is about two-thirds of the way out in the second insert, which means it's, uh, you know, there's a very famous book about World War II and the Aleutian Islands called The Thousand Mile War. Uh, ADAC is about 800 miles out in the Aleutian chain, so it, it's pretty far out there. When I went to see my fiance, she said, uh, so where are we going, Boston or New York? <laughs> yes, sort of. The, <laughs> I said, ADAC, Alaska. And that's the response I got from her. And uh, it was even worse when I showed her the, uh, the atlas. And uh, I'm very fortunate that she still continued to consent to marry me. I'm very fortunate that she's been with me now for 40 years. And what she will tell you is that uh, ADAC and our two years out on ADAC, Alaska, which was a Navy base at the time, uh, but also our home port, uh, was probably two of the most formative years of our marriage because uh, I was never there. The ship was constantly underway. So she learned resilience. Uh, she learned self-confidence. Uh, she learned to innovate. Uh, she learned to uh, uh, human relations skills that have served her uh, for many, many years and really made her a wonderful first lady of the Coast Guard uh, during my time as commandant because she could identify with a lot of the challenges our young families face uh, as they started in the career. But for me, it was even more formative uh, because I wanted to be a sailor. And I can't think of any more challenging proving ground than the Bering Sea uh, to learn how to be a sailor. We were in a small ship, and uh, during the two years I was there, we covered uh, area from Seattle, Washington, all the way up above the Arctic Circle and every inch of coastline in between, the entire Aleutian Islands. Uh, we sailed down to Honolulu for training with the Navy. We covered a lot of ocean. But I can tell you that never, uh, I had an additional 14 years of sea duty uh, during my career, and never have I ever experienced weather as severe and sustained as in the Bering Sea. Uh, there are storms up there that, uh, based on their characteristics, in the Caribbean, you would call them a hurricane. In Alaska, in the Bering Sea, it's normal weather during the wintertime. And instead of passing over in a 24-hour period, it stays there for sometimes weeks on end, and you just get battered. Uh, it'll either make you choose not to be a sailor anymore or will convince you that this is what I want to do. And fortunately for me, it uh, taught me that this is what I wanted to do. I would also say that I learned about the, what I call the tyranny of time and distance. You know that uh, 800 miles out to ADAC? Well, when you're steaming around in a ship that only goes 12 knots, it takes you a long time to get places in Alaska. And from ADAC all the way up above the Arctic Circle, it's about 900 miles. From uh, Dutch Harbor, which is the largest deep water port in, in Alaska, uh, out in the Aleutian chain, it's about 900 miles up to where Shell is operating right now. So the nearest deep water port for Shell is about 900 miles away. For Coast Guard cutters that patrol the northern Bering Sea or up into the Arctic, the nearest place they can refuel is Dutch Harbor. So uh, the United States is rather limited in terms of its infrastructure, deep water ports, uh, telecommunications challenges, and others. But I learned about these things 40 years ago. 
we were navigating then with Loran A. Loran C was just making, uh, 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 making its way in. Uh, there were many times if we had any stars or sun, we would have to use celestial navigation. Some of the places we went into had charts that were handmade with soundings that had been taken over the years uh, by other Coast Guardsmen who had been into these areas. And while we now have GPS and a little bit better communications, there are still challenges up there, just as we found uh, with the shell vessel that was coming out of Dutch Harbor that thought there was plenty of water and uh, ripped, I think it was a, a nine-foot uh, crease in its hull as it tried to ex exit the, the harbor. And what they did was they found a little rock promontory that was never charted before, and uh, now it is. But you have that throughout Alaska. So it, was, uh, it taught me lessons that stayed with me my entire career, up until the point where I became commandant. And it became obvious to me that equities for the United States Coast Guard and for the United States were increasing as this large Arctic Ocean area was having reduced ice and more open water for longer in the year, and a consequently uh, an increase in human activity. And I wanted to make sure that my service was prepared for the future. We developed a Coast Guard Arctic strategy, which was released uh, directly after the National uh, Arctic strategy uh, signed by the President back in 2013. So uh, I went back as Commandant in 2010. Uh, my first experience up there was 1975 to 77. I went back in 2010 uh, to refamiliarize myself with the Arctic. And there was one really significant thing that I noticed. Because in 1976, when I crossed the Arctic Circle for the first time, we went to the city of Kotzebue. And uh, we were looking for ice leads. I flew in a helicopter to look for ice leads. And when we landed in Kotzebue, I could see ice from the shoreline out as far as I could see towards the horizon. And this was in July of 1976. The same time of the year, 36 years later, 2010, I flew into Kotzebue in a Gulf Stream this time, descending from a couple thousand feet. And as I looked down at the shore and as far out as I could see on the horizon, and my horizon was much further out than it was in 1976, there was no ice to be seen whatsoever. Uh, about 36 years difference. And I went back and looked at the records. And what I saw in 1976, all that ice, was not an anomaly. It was the normal for that, uh, that time in our history. And what I saw in 2010 was not an anomaly either. It is the new normal, uh, the lack of ice. Uh, consequently, with what I call now soft water, there's an increase in human activity. And I would contend that we need to be ready for it. But the Arctic Council uh, gives me now that I've left the Coast Guard, the uh, Arctic Council gives me an opportunity, first of all, uh, to work within the government to make sure that we're prepared for our chairmanship of the Arctic Council but it also gives me the opportunity to work within the Arctic um, Executive Steering Committee, which was created by the President's executive order uh, last January. And uh, we're making progress on both fronts, both internationally and domestically. And uh, I'm here to talk just briefly about the Arctic Council and what we're doing there, uh, but then transition to perhaps give you a thought piece as we prepare for our, our, uh, the, uh, uh, the folks that will come on here later. So. Uh, the slides are off to the side, and so I want to make sure that I think I advanced you too far. The, the history of the, the Arctic Council is it started out in 1991 as the Arctic en Environmental Protection Strategy, which was, uh, which was uh, uh, initiated by Finland. Uh, Finland has been a leader in, in Arctic affairs. It brought the eight countries of the Arctic Council together. And for those that aren't familiar with the countries of the Arctic, it's the United States, Canada, Iceland, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia. These are the eight countries that make up the Arctic Council. The Arctic Council was created by the Ottawa Decla Declaration in 1996 uh, with a focus within its charter to promote cooperation, uh, coordination, and interaction between the Arctic states with a focus on sustainable development and environmental protection. And those have been the tenets of the Arctic Council ever since over the last 20 years, with very little variation. Everything that's done within the Arctic Council, because it's an international forum, is done by consensus. Uh, we don't talk, take up any issues unless there's consensus from all eight countries. So when you uh, propose a rather aggressive chairmanship program like the United States has, uh, it takes a lot of negotiation, a lot of listening, and that starts uh, within the United States. Uh, our Arctic Council structure, ah, 
and I have it in front of me as well. I didn't notice that before. This makes it much easier. Uh, the Arctic Council structure, as I said, is the eight countries. We have uh, 22 observers, uh, including 12 uh, observer states. Uh, we have a, a number of observers who are waiting to come onto the council as well. And I think perhaps most importantly, uh, one of the, the major components of what we do is we have the six permanent participants, which are the groups that represent the indigenous peoples of the, of the high latitudes. And while they aren't uh, voting members, uh, we certainly seek their advice and their counsel, and it's very important to take them into consideration, taking into consideration people who will live there uh, by some reports up to 10,000 years uh, and have their own cultures, uh, their own way of life, and uh, how do we uh, how do we come up with programs that are compatible with that as well? A uh, couple of the landmark projects, in my estimation, from the Arctic Council was a 2004 Climate Impact Assessment, the 2009 Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment, and then two of my favorites. In 2011, they came up with a Maritime Search and Rescue Agreement, and in 2013, the Marine Oil Spill Preparedness and Response Agreement. And uh, as a person who was an operator who served in the Coast Guard for nearly 40 years, uh, agreements are fine, but part of our chairmanship program is to start exercising those agreements because it's only through exercising those agreements that we will be able to get lessons learned uh, to document uh, where our shortcomings are, where we, uh, where we might be able to share resources amongst the countries of the Arctic. And I'm very excited about the prospect of that. In fact, we're having a search and rescue uh, exercise tabletop uh, event up in Alaska this fall. Uh, all eight of the Arctic countries under the auspices of the Arctic Coast Guard Forum uh, will come together for that exercise and then we're very hopeful and our plans call for a full-scale operational exercise within the Arctic in the summer of 2016. Uh, the chairmanship team, uh, Secretary Kerry, uh, is the official chairman of the Arctic Council for our two-year endeavor. Uh, as you might imagine, the Secretary of State of the United States has a few other things on his plate as well. Uh, so he brought me on in this capacity to take care of the day-to-day -day dealings with the Arctic Council and also to coordinate Arctic activities across all the bureaus within the State Department and also uh, be the liaison for the State Department in the interagency process here in Washington. Uh, Fran Ulmer, former Lieutenant Governor of Alaska, is, our, is uh, one of our uh, special advisors. And uh, the chair of the senior Arctic officials, the Arctic officials, the eight Arctic senior Arctic officials is where most of the business of the Arctic Council gets done. Uh, Julie, Julie Gorley is our SAO. Uh, she's been in the job for about a decade now. And Ambassador David Balton, uh, we get the chair of the uh, uh, SAOs as well uh, since we have the chairmanship. Uh, Ambassador David Balton uh, has a, a breadth of experience in ocean and Arctic activities and fisheries, and uh, we were very fortunate to get him in that position. Uh, one of the things we tried to do, and I spoke about this with the group earlier, is we wanted to have a very balanced program. Uh, if you focus on any one issue, whether it's Arctic security issues, uh, uh, you know, dealing with the effects of climate change uh, and others, unless you have something that's balanced, unless there's uh, constituencies see something in it for them, uh, you're going to cut off some very important groups. And we want all groups to be interested in our Arctic program. So we broke down uh, our program into three areas. The first is Arctic Ocean Safety, Security, and Stewardship with about six different projects, including exercising the Search and Rescue Agreement and the uh, Marine Pollution uh, Response Agreement. Uh, the second is uh, improving economic and living conditions. Very important, uh, particularly after you meet the people of the North. Uh, we have about a half dozen projects under that as well. And then uh, the third is addressing the impacts of climate change. And what I found as I've gone and I've uh, spoken to groups both in Alaska, here in Washington, and visiting each and every one of the Arctic Council countries is uh, first and foremost, they've, they've appreciated the fact that it's balanced. Uh, the second comment I get the most is uh, it, it's very ambitious, Admiral, except from one person, Secretary John Kerry. He constantly asks me, are we doing enough? Is there anything else we can be doing? So I think we found some balance there as well. Uh, the third question I get asked the most is, what about Russia? And uh, during Q&A, perhaps we might talk a little bit about that, but uh, suffice to say, it's a consensus-based organization. It's very important to have Russia on board, and I've been doing a lot of work 
uh, with our Russian colleagues to make sure that we're engaged and cooperating and communicating, most importantly. Uh, the third, uh, rather the fourth uh, most common comment is we're excited about United States leadership. Uh, but then the fifth comment, which is probably germane to what we're discussing this afternoon, is we're uh, excited about U.S. leadership, but we're a little concerned about United States commitment. And by commitment, I think most people look and they say, what sort of resources are you devoting to the Arctic? And when we can't get uh, a replacement icebreaker built, uh, when we haven't been able to uh, uh, develop a deep water port, uh, when there's challenges with telecommunications and other things, uh, people uh, legitimately question our commitment. But I think there's some good news there uh, to be told, uh, particularly since the President's executive order, the creation of the Arctic Executive Steering Committee, and the fact that we're starting to prioritize some of the uh, challenges that we've faced up there. So that's just a, a quick overview of our chairmanship program. Uh, one of the things I'm very excited about as we sit here today is we're about a week, a little over a week away from something called Glacier. Uh, Glacier stands for Global Leadership in the Arctic, Innovation, uh, Engagement, I'm sorry, Cooperation, Innovation, Engagement, and Resilience, Glacier. Uh, it's a really cute uh, a phrase. Uh, obviously, it has uh, a connection to what we're doing in the Arctic. Uh, but most importantly for me, I selected it because it was the name of one of our United States Coast Guard icebreakers, which is decommissioned. And of course, we're still trying to advocate for icebreakers, and hopefully uh, we'll have a little bit of discussion on that here this afternoon. But I, I want to get into the thought piece here uh, this afternoon. And this is something that started coming to me uh, when I attended that Arctic Circle event in Iqaluit, uh, I'm sorry, within, uh, in Reykjavik, and then uh, was further advanced when I went to the Arctic Council Ministerial in Iqaluit in April when we assumed the chairmanship. And the thought process started because when we went to Iqaluit, as like anything else, I'm interested in history, wanted to know a little bit about the place, and I learned that it used to be called Frobisher. And if, uh, it was changed to the Indian name of Iqaluit uh, later on, but it still sits on Frobisher Bay. And I thought, well, who was Frobisher? Well, Martin Frobisher, an English uh, sea captain, uh, who in the late 1500s, 1576, uh, was exploring for the Northwest Passage. So 1500s, uh, Great Britain was looking for the Northwest Passage to try and find a more efficient route uh, to, the, uh, to the Far East in order to conduct trade. Uh, even back then, prosperity, economics, uh, and coming up with more efficient sea routes was important. But why was it important? And why, uh, nearly 200 late years later, I uh, visited an, uh, an exhibit in Anchorage recently. Uh, the exhibit's about Captain James Cook. Uh, of course, Anchorage, uh, it was discovered by Cook uh, back in uh, 17... Uh, 78, and uh, I started looking, and, and the reason he was there was because 200 years after Frobisher, Great Britain's Admiralty was still giving orders to search for a Northwest Passage, except he was looking at it from uh, the other direction. Uh, his last cruise out to, the, uh, out to the Pacific, his third cruise, uh, took him on orders uh, up around the North American continent into the Arctic Ocean, and of course was stopped by ice. Uh, he had to turn around, and uh, that was unfortunate as well, because if he had not uh, been stopped and not turned around, he probably wouldn't have gone back to Hawaii, uh, where he was unfortunately killed, and his first mate had to take uh, the remainder of the cruise and get the ship back to Europe. But uh, why were they searching for it, and uh, why were they so persistent, and why are we still talking about coming up with uh, those routes today? Well, I did a little studying, and I became... Uh, very interested in maritime sea powers, and I started working my way back from Frobisher and Great Britain in the late 1500s. And what I ended up with was studying Venice. Uh, Venice was the, the premier maritime power in the known maritime world from the late 1300s into the mid-1500s. Uh, they were a small, they still are, a small, vulnerable island nation. Uh, small in population, small in geography, but they maintained uh, great geopolitics. They were able to survive and conduct trade between the Ottoman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, and Christian Europe. 
Uh, they maintained, uh, they were able to maintain uh, seaports in the Black Sea and other locations and then take land routes across Asia to the Far East to bring goods back to all its trading partners. Uh, it started losing the geopolitical part of it uh, when uh, they uh, joined sides with Christian Europe to start transporting uh, armies for the Crusades and uh, lost their support from the Ottoman Empire. And they also let technology get by them. Uh, they relied uh, on uh, galleys. They rode galleys uh, with, uh, with uh, their uh, innovation was using free men instead of slaves uh, to row their galleys. Uh, but they never ventured out into the Atlantic. Meanwhile, because other countries wanted the same prosperity Venice was having, they started exploring, most notably Portugal, uh, which started uh, improving innovation and developing better sailing ships, uh, ships that allowed them to sail closer to the wind, and they started uh, going down and exploring along the coast of Africa until they found their way around the uh, Cape of Good Hope and found a sea route to India and China where they could uh, then conduct trade back to Europe. Uh, the Spanish went in the other direction. They went across the Atlantic and then eventually started crossing the Isthmus of Panama and going to the Far East. And then the Brits and the French and uh, other countries became involved, but the British were focused on this Northwest Passage. How do you get around North America? Well, as we get into the future, the, those, uh, those sea routes that uh, were developed in the early days of sail continue to today, uh, with the exception of the Suez Canal, which uh, gave you a, a more efficient route to get to uh, Asia uh, through the Straits of Malacca, uh, the Panama Canal, which allows you to go across the Atlantic and in the Pacific, or over the Pacific back to the Atlantic. And for centuries, these sea routes have stayed the same. And consequently, we now have powerhouses in the Far East. Most notably, and where is our representative from Singapore? This is where I start talking about Singapore. Uh, Singapore has become the number one transshipment point in Asia. They are the number one port. They are the most efficient. And interestingly enough, they are a small, vulnerable island nation. They maintain great geostrategic relationships. They get along with everybody, whether it's China, Vietnam, the United States, you name it. Uh, the Singaporeans are, are great partners with just about everybody, and it has contributed to their prosperity. They're also great innovators. Uh, they know how to run ports. They've developed great uh, uh, cargo handling equipment. Uh, they build uh, drilling rigs and other things. They uh, have kept up with technology, and they maintain their relationships. So it was while visiting Singapore a few years ago, I uh, went in the Distinguished Visitors Program, I was sitting over dinner, and I was talking to a, a minister from their government. And uh, at a certain point, I said, you know what? You are the modern-day Venice. And he looked at me and smiled, and he knew exactly what I was talking about. And he said, you're right. Uh, and it was obvious that he had studied history. He understood the need. They understood the need for good geostrategic relationships and uh, staying up with technology. And they became one of the greatest trading ports in the world. So, a little bit later, in fact, it was during this conference in Reykjavik, Iceland, at Arctic Circle, uh, there was a lecture given. And uh, this is a slide that I got from one of the first lectures that was given during the plenary session on the first day. And it was done by a scientist who was talking about the potential for sea routes in, through the Arctic uh, over the next century. Of course, the, uh, the red route there is the northern sea route, which is opening up, and there's been an increase in traffic above Russia. Uh, the green route is the Northwest Passage, and of course, that will take longer for it to open up, but Canada is making good strides in the, northern, uh, in the Northwest Passage now in terms of getting to its mines and getting through the, uh, and, and carrying cargo with ice strengthened ships. And uh, he gave predictions on uh, when that might come open. And then, of course, the blue route is the transpolar route, which is the shortest route of all. And, it, and there are scientists that believe uh, by the middle of this next century, by uh, 2050, uh, there will be months of the year where there will be no ice, and you will be able to use this much sh shorter route across the, uh, across the pole. And uh, there's any estimates of anywhere from 8 to 10 days of transit time that could be saved by using that route. But what caught my attention was if you look where all those vectors end up, on the, on the bottom side of the chart, a small island nation. 
that maintains great relationships with many people. So the next morning after this lecture, I started thinking about this, and by chance, I was having breakfast with the Singapore delegation. And I said to the minister, the same minister that I had met in Singapore, I said, so what are you doing here in Iceland? He said, well, Admiral, we're a small, vulnerable island nation. We're worried about climate change. We're worried about the rising ocean and a host of other things, and we want to be here and, and be engaged. And I said, Mr. Minister, no, you're not. You're here because you're worried about Iceland becoming the next Singapore. And he smiled at me with that smile of, yes, that's right. And I said, so what are you doing about it? And he says, well, that's why we're here. We know how to run ports. We know how to build container cranes. Uh, we've been doing this uh, for many, many decades, and we feel that we can be of assistance to the people of Iceland uh, as they develop over the coming century. And if we can establish these relationships, we go back to our country and we start looking at how we retool our industries. We look at how we uh, change the curriculums in our schools. We need to be prepared for 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50 years from now, and we're focused on that. And I thought therein lies the lesson. Here in Washington, we generally can't focus more than 12 months in advance or, or at the most, the next election cycle. It's very hard for us to get involved in thinking about what's happening 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50 years from now. But uh, Singapore is doing it. Uh, I think they've got the right mindset. They're getting prepared for their future because prosperity is important. And, uh, and they, that's why you find them at Arctic Circle in Reykjavik, Iceland. Uh, the other large delegation after Singapore was China. Now, China, I did not get a chance to communicate with. Uh, I, I didn't meet with them while I was there, but I believe they are thinking some of the same things. Because if you go back to that uh, piece of map that I showed uh, Singapore on, you see Shanghai and Hong Kong. Those are rather major ports as well. And China has a need for energy resources. And if you can bring them from the Barents Sea across the northern sea route and save four or five or six days of transit time to get energy products to China, uh, they're going to take advantage of it. That's why they're building icebreakers. That's why they are exploring. That's why they are making scientific observations in the Arctic. So to wrap this up, uh, the next major event I went to was an event called Arctic Frontiers, which is held in Tromso, Norway. And uh, I got the opportunity. Uh, Norway's foreign minister, Borga Brenda, uh, is, a, is a very good friend and uh, is very enthusiastic. And he was very generous with his time with me. And we had a chance to sit over lunch and then have a private meeting together. And I gave him my theory about why Singapore is, uh, was in Reykjavik, Iceland. Of course, the same Singapore delegation was in Tromso as well. So Minister Brenda looked at me and he says, well, Admiral, your theory is almost right. And I said, what do you mean by that, Mr. Minister? He said, it's not going to be Reykjavik. It's going to be Tromso. <laughs> and sure enough, when I spoke to the delegation from Singapore, that's why they're in Tromso as well. Uh, I think the United States could learn some lessons. Uh, other countries are preparing for the Arctic. Uh, the challenge is finding the balance. How do, you, how do you protect the environment? How do you sustain the, uh, the environment? But also look for development as well, economic development and prosperity. Because the people of the North deserve uh, the, the benefits of that prosperity as well. We're hopeful that our Arctic Council chairmanship and the, uh, the balanced program that we put out there will be helpful. But more importantly, we need to draw the attention of the American people. Uh, the American people are very disconnected from our Arctic, which is understandable. As I told a group earlier, uh, where we are here today in Washington is 3,500 miles from Barrow, Alaska. And there's a whole lot of Canadian territory in between here and there. So we are both physically and culturally uh, uh, disconnected from our U.S. Arctic. And we need to change that. Hopefully the Glacier Conference, uh, with the participation of Secretary Kerry and the President, uh, and uh, the chairmanship of the Arctic Council will help to raise that awareness level for the people of the United States and will, in the, in the long term, uh, help us to get engaged and start developing our infrastructure in the Arctic as well. Uh, so thank you for your attention. Uh, 
this is the first time I've rolled out in this city this theory about uh, the, the Arctic and uh, Singapore and uh, Reykjavik and Tromso, uh, but I find it very interesting and it's backed up in fact by, by talking to these people. So at this point, uh, I've got a few minutes that we can devote to Q&A and I welcome your questions. Good afternoon, Admiral Larry Luxner, uh, news editor of the Washington Diplomat. Um, yesterday, it was reported that the uh, uh, that Hillary Clinton's campaign came out against um, drilling in the Arctic in the waters off Alaska, something that the Obama administration seems to favor. And I'm wondering if you could please comment on that. Thank you. Uh, I can't comment on uh, anything that was put out by the campaign because I simply haven't seen it. Uh, what I can say that. Uh, uh, it depends on what focus you take. Uh, I, I have been uh, to speak in front of environmental groups where I get into question and answer period, and literally there was a person who stood up and said, I'm so disappointed in your president. And I said, well, wait a minute, he's our president first and foremost, uh, but why are you disappointed? And uh, he said, because the president is opening up the Alaskan Arctic to everybody. Well, I traveled up to Alaska uh, about a week after that, and I spoke to a group up there, and a gentleman got up at the end of the, uh, at, at the, end of the speech during Q&A, and uh, he said, I am so disappointed with your president. He's closing down Alaska to everybody. So there's, uh, there is a, uh, a difference of opinion. Uh, clearly, the president has, uh, has signed orders to set aside certain areas and protect them. Uh, Shell and other companies have uh, gone through a legitimate legal process uh, to buy leases, and uh, and they have passed uh, the uh, the requirements for gaining permits through the Department of Interior, and uh, they are proceeding with legal, legitimate business. Uh, and I think uh, what this administration has done is it's tried to find a balance. Uh, this uh, this administration has been focused on climate change, uh, looking for renewable resources. Uh, developing renewable resources, but the reality, they are, they're also pragmatic. They understand that we're going to need petroleum products, fossil fuels uh, for the foreseeable future, and companies that are in that business have a right to be able to explore as long as they uh, live within the safety regulations and go through the proper permitting processes and uh, do it in a safe and sustainable manner. So I, I don't see a disconnect in what the administration is doing. Yes, ma'am. I'm Guru Holm from, uh, from the Norwegian Broadcasting, uh, representing Tromsø. <laughs> um, uh, now, uh, following up on that, uh, Statoil, the Norwegian state oil company, they have abstained. They, they, in contradiction to Shell, they decided not to drill in the Chukchi uh, area uh, in Al outside Alaska. So. Uh, could you could you elaborate a little bit more about the risk concerns? But because certainly it's not risk free, which I think also is something that the Obama administration has admitted. It's not risk free, but yeah. it's a balance. So could you say a little bit more about that? And even also, what role the Arctic Council could and will play, given the consensus principle when it comes to commercial activity in vulnerable areas in the yeah. Arctic. Uh, I, I'm not familiar with uh, what the, uh, the thought process was for Statoil. Uh, what I do know in terms of my observations in talking to the various oil companies over time is that, uh, this is just my opinion, my impression, is that they are willing to let, uh, let Shell take point on this. Uh, Shell has had some challenges uh, starting up in the Chuck GC. There are other companies, obviously, that own leases up there. But uh, I think uh, because of the, uh, uh, the downward uh, price in oil, uh, concerns about how much our companies spending exploring for what they're not certain is there yet, uh, that they're, I think it's a wait and see attitude. Let's see how Shell does before we proceed. That, that's just PAP's opinion. I, I, I can only. Uh, uh, attribute that to just listening to people and doing so, some assessments myself. As far as Shell goes, uh, they've, they've been put through a very rigorous process. Uh, they, uh, they, like I, I spoke about earlier in my uh, presentation, 
uh, they have learned exactly what I learned as a young sailor. It's a very challenging environment up there. Having said that, the, uh, the oil explore, exploration process is, is relatively, I, I would never say easy, but it's, it's simpler. Uh, it's very shallow water. Uh, most geologists that I've spoken to say that uh, the oil is under much less pressure and, it, and is not that far down. Uh, and uh, the reality is if, if we had not had the Macondo well blowout uh, back in 2010 in the Gulf of Mexico, we probably wouldn't be scrutinizing this as closely as we are right now. So we learned a lot of lessons. I mean, in the past, we would never have, a, a, we probably would not have had a capping stack and, the, and, and an alternate uh, a drill rig to drill a relief well. These are all new requirements based upon what we learned in, uh, in Deepwater Horizon event in the Gulf of Mexico. Yet at the same time, it's a completely different scenario. This is very shallow water. That was very deep water. High pressure in the Gulf, uh, uh, low pressure up there. It's the environmentals that probably give us the most concern. Uh, the fact that there's still ice up there that, uh, that drifts around. They found that out uh, uh, two years ago, uh, three years ago uh, when they were up there. But in my previous assignment as Commandant of the Coast Guard and uh, from my continuing interest, I've been to meet with Shell. I've looked at their plans. I've looked at their resources that they're devoting. And, uh, and they are getting supervision from the United States Coast Guard while they're on scene up there as well. So I think they are as prepared as they can be. Uh, they, they think they have the wherewithal to be able to do it. And they're doing it under the legal processes that the United States government has uh, placed out there in front of them. And they've passed uh, every step so far. So I, I wish them luck. And, uh, and, uh, and good fortune because uh, we don't want to be in the, uh, having to deal with uh, adverse consequences. Yes? What are some of the additional steps uh, that the U.S. needs to take to protect its interests in the Arctic and also to persuade other countries that the U.S. is in fact committed to that region? Well, I think both from uh, some of the things that uh, we documented in our Coast Guard Arctic strategy, uh, some of the things that are in the National Arctic strategy and its implementation plan, and, uh, uh, and I would say Alaska's Arctic strategy as well. Uh, there are certain things that, uh, that are uh, common to all three things. Uh, first and foremost, build icebreakers. Uh, you know, I, I was uh, testifying before the Senate not too long ago, and they, and they said, uh, you know, Admiral, there's uh, one study that says we need six heavy icebreakers. There's another one that says we need four heavy, four medium. And I just listened to it, and I said, well, and they said, how many do we need? And I said, well, I'm not sure, but uh, if we have all those studies, wouldn't you think we could at least build one? And, and there's some truth to that. Uh, I would like to see us building at least one. Having said that, we're, we're in a little bit better situation than we were a few years ago when we didn't have the money to support, uh, enough money to support any of our icebreakers. Uh, Polar Star is back in service and is doing well, uh, breaking out McMurdo and Antarctica, and Healy continues to do well. Uh, but they really need some backup, and I'm very hopeful that uh, we'll make progress on the icebreaker. Uh, development of a deep water port. As I said, uh, the nearest deep water port is uh, Dutch Harbor. Nome is close, but uh, it's very shallow. Uh, I think the controlling depth in Nome is 22 feet of water. Uh, and even though they're going to expand that, the Corps of Engineers has a project, it's never going to get much deeper than about 30 feet. There are other locations closer to the Bering Strait that have good deep water and could be developed as ports, but it's going to take significant effort to be able to do that. Uh, telecommunications, uh, at least in the North American Arctic, is uh, I'm, there are no fiber optic. Well, I, I, there's one fiber optic cable in Alaska, and it goes up to Prudhoe Bay. Uh, but uh, all the villages, uh, the cities along the North Slope, none of them, uh, they rely upon terrestrial microwave, which is just terrible in terms of uh, trying to support some of the things we do uh, with technology uh, nowadays. Uh, so we need some improvement there, not just for our people who live there, but uh, with the increase in maritime traffic, uh, we need to be able to share information circumpolar between the countries that border the Arctic Ocean uh, for search and rescue activities, maritime response, and maritime domain awareness. So uh, those are some off the top of my head. Uh, clearly, NOAA could use some money for uh, charting. Uh, some, some of the soundings, I'm told, by both the Navy and by NOAA, 
Uh, go back to 1778 when Captain Cook went up there and they were using a piece of lead on the end of a, a line and doing, uh, uh, physically doing soundings along the coast up there and uh, they are still being used. We need, we need to update that. And then uh, telecommunication satellites. Most of the telecommunication, telecommunication satellites are optimally positioned for the middle latitudes. They don't uh, serve as well for the, uh, uh, the higher latitudes. GPS is pretty good worldwide, so uh, uh, we're pretty good there in terms of navigation. But uh, there's a whole range of activities. As I said, they're common to Alaska, Coast Guard Arctic strategy, and the, uh, the President's national strategy. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Admiral. Thank you. Hi, Admiral. Amy Sparkdahlmeyer from Bethel, Alaska. My family are from Chivak, Alaska, on the Bering Sea coast. I said hi to you before, and I've told you before that my people are uh, people of the seal. So we rely on um, on the mammals, marine mammals of the Bering Sea. And it's interesting uh, what you brought up, like the. Uh, uh, what would be considered a, a major hurricane is just sometimes Tuesday or a whole week in Alaska. Um, I wanted to find out how, uh, how heartened would a community like Nome or any of our communities on the Bering Sea or up the coast, now that there is attention and um, the Corps just put out a, I, I think they just announced that they would, um, they, they put out the plan to deepen the Nome port to 28 feet. Yes. And there are, um, like the mayor, Denise Michaels, and there are uh, members of the community who have pursued a, a deep water port much deeper than the proposed 28 feet. How, how possible is it for Nome or any other community to, to um, find this or get this uh, deep water port? Yeah, uh, well, that's, a, that's a Corps of Engineers project to take it down to 28 feet. It needs to extend the breakwater out a little bit further too. But the challenge that you face there is uh, you don't go down very far <laughs> Uh, off the coast there, and you're just into rock. And so it's very difficult to deepen the port there. There are other places closer to the Bering Strait. Port Clarence being one of them uh, is a great natural deep water harbor, uh, but uh, right now does not have uh, uh, reliable roads, uh, an airstrip or something like that can, that can get to it. So it's going to require significant investment. But that's part of what this is all about, is to draw attention to this and hopefully start moving things uh, within the administration as we develop the, uh, the implementation plan and set some priorities and then get them to the Congress. Like anything else, it's tough here in the city. Uh, the, the federal budget is under a lot of pressure. Most of the things in the Arctic are new starts and new starts are having a tough time. So we need to take advantage this next two years during the chairmanship to raise the awareness as much as we can. That's why we're sending so many of the Arctic Council meetings to Alaska. That's why we're doing the Glacier Conference in, in Anchorage. Uh, so that we can gain the attention of the world, but most importantly, U.S. citizens. Sure. Thank you. Um, one other community around my region um, in Macquarie, it's a, actually a, a giant island off of uh, southwest Alaska, off of uh, the Kuskokwim River. Um, they've pursued a port, and they've, uh, they've invited studies by the Corps of Engineers for years. Um, just, just to give uh, a shine a spotlight, like you said, um, uh, how can we benefit from from improved uh, passage and prosperity? Um, just to give people an idea about what we pay for in stores in our villages, which are not um, which are not connected to roads. My region, when I say my region, it's the delta made by the Yukon and Kuskokwim rivers out to the Bering Sea. It's about the size of Oregon, but you have to imagine Oregon without roads. So um, to to purchase items in a store that may be only a village corporation built because nobody else will come and build a store. You could spend uh, $50 for a, um, uh, like a three pound box of dish, uh, laundry detergent. Um, you could spend uh, $80 for a box of diapers. You could spend $70 for, um, for baby formula. It's, um, we're kind of held hostage by our locale, but we're, we're tied to our land and our culture, and that's where we want to live. But we imagine um, the benefits as well uh, of of improved um, improved uh, um, transportation yeah, infrastructure right. 
and, exactly. and once again, it's a maritime environment up there. And you're right. Uh, last time I was up in Barrow, it was $7.50 a gallon for uh, gasoline. Right. Uh, it was $9 for a half gallon of milk. Uh, so, uh, yes, it's, yeah. it's very expensive. Very comparable. Uh, I think I'm starting to eat into other people's time here, so I'll, I'll just wrap it up by saying uh, you reminded me of a, a, a little story. Uh, I visited Kotzebue uh, last year, and I was speaking with a, uh, an Alaska native named Ikalusek, who is a subsistence hunter. He hunts seal uh, to, uh, uh, for their food, and uh, he told me the story of the seal expert from Washington who came up to visit Kotzebue and, and meet with them and uh, and give him his expertise on, on seals. And so when Ikalusik uh, met the uh, seal expert, he says, so you're a seal expert from Washington. How many seals have you eaten? So uh, I've sort of categorized people as seal hunters and seal experts. And there are a lot of people with passion, but unless you visit there, unless you go uh, to the Arctic and meet the people and learn about them, you're never gonna be an expert. So we need to get more people and increase their awareness. So thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the panel here. Thanks. try to further um, um, give some more different dimensions, some different perspectives on what's going on in the Arctic to, to hopefully contribute to Admiral Papp's insights and perspectives. Our first guest, and I'm very honored to be seated here with him, is Ambassador um, Gear, Hardy Gear of, uh, I mean, Gear Hardy, sorry, I inverted it, Gear Hardy of Iceland. And prior to serving as Ambassador of Iceland in the United States, um, um, Ambassador Hardy served as uh, Prime Minister of Iceland from 2006 to 2009. Um, next to um, Ambassador Hardy is um, Isaac Edwards. Sorry, I usually don't speak in public too much, so I'm a little bit shy. But is, is Isaac Edwards, and Isaac Edwards is Chief Counsel for um, Senator Lisa Murkowski um, on the uh, Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. And then my, co uh, my colleague, Luke Coffey, who is a Thatcher Center. Uh, fellow here at Heritage. So, Ambassador Gear. Well, thank you, <clears throat> and thank you for organizing this event. A special thanks to Admiral Papp for his enlightening remarks and his uh, great oversight over, over all these issues that he gave us and hi the historical um, perspective that, that came along with it. Um, I guess <clears throat> since he departed quite a bit from, from the title, does the US have the infrastructure, ships, and equipment required? I am also allowed to do the same. Mm -hmm. And I'd, uh, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about these issues from the perspective of the country where I come from, that's to say, from Iceland. And I'm very happy uh, to use uh, Admiral Papp's reference uh, point uh, for me also to extrapolate a little bit uh, on on the things that might be uh, important for us in, in, in the context. Um, the picture is no longer there, but uh, it was quite illuminating. You know, if the sea routes open to this extent, we, competing with Tromsø, uh, um, you know, might be in a quite uh, unique situation with respect to the different uh, <coughs> possibilities that will open up as far as trade and, um, and shipping. Of course, this could be 10, 20, 50 years into the future, but uh, uh, one has to start uh, planning. But I would like to make the point, uh, unlike Alaska, we actually do have the infrastructure now to deal with most of that, and if we have 10 or not to mention 50 years to complete what would be required, uh, that would not be a problem. I mean, we have a developed economy, we have a developed island, we have the airstrips, we have the international uh, air runways, uh, we have the ports. 
And uh, so this would be, uh, uh, from our perspective, a very exciting development if it were to materialize. Of course, uh, that is, I guess, more or less uh, a little bit of guesswork right now. Uh, anybody's guess whether it will go this way, particularly with the route uh, straight across the, uh, the Polar Sea. But it's exciting. And this is only from the point of view of shaping, transportation, uh, economic development, and so on. Of course, the other side of that would be what would be the environmental impact of uh, all this uh, ice disappearing and what would be the, the other type of uh, uh, effects from those, uh, those developments. So there are positives and there are negatives in this, in this picture. But it's quite, uh, it's quite interesting. And people who are known to think decades ahead, like the Chinese and the Singaporeans and, and others, of course, have started to look at this. Maybe this explains why the Chinese have taken such a great interest in, in what is happening in Iceland, why they have such a big presence there. And it's been a theory for quite a while that this exactly is the, is the reason why that is, uh, why that is so. Uh, and that is not a sinister approach. It is just, you know, people exploring, uh, you know, what their own possibilities might be in a, in a new situation. Now, I'd like to mention another uh, uh, thing that uh, also came up in Admiral Papp's uh, remarks, and that is search and rescue. And we have this uh, agreement from 2011, the NUC agreement on, on uh, search and rescue. And... Um, we, I think, are ideally placed to, to be the hub for this. As far as this part of the Arctic, of course, we would not be able to serve uh, Alaska, but, uh, but uh, ocean uh, liners, cruise ships, and others that are exploring and going, venturing into the, the Arctic region normally would pass by Iceland. They are at risk of something happening, and it would be, I think, uh, a normal uh, positioning for uh, such a hub to be in Iceland, where we, by the way, also have the facilities and the, uh, the, the, uh, the wherewithal that would be needed. But I guess, as they say in the, in the computer business, that this would be plug and play. Anybody who wants to, to come can come and take part and contribute, but people would, of course, have to organize uh, an exercise and, and and so on, and maybe given what the situation is like uh, in the geopolitical sense, it might be, uh, I think, uh, good to start with a limited number of countries, maybe the US, uh, Iceland, and, and uh, Denmark on behalf of Greenland, uh, who are in the neighborhood, Norway, uh, and, um, and take it from there. Uh, but we are certainly very interested, uh, and the government of Iceland, in, in promoting this idea and turn it into a reality. I think that's quite feasible and a relatively easy thing to do if everybody is, uh, has the interest, and if people do have the interest. Um, uh, one uh, further point I'd like to make, and has not been mentioned by anybody, uh, not at the luncheon and not by Admiral Papp, and of course, it's, uh, uh, it's relevant for the Arctic context, and, and that is fishing. Um, fishing is a very important uh, industry, both in Iceland and in many other Arctic countries, and it needs to be managed and, and done in a sustainable way. That's how we run our fisheries. That's how our fisheries management is based on a scientific, sustainable basis. And we were, I'd like to make the point that we were a bit disappointed when the so-called Arctic Five countries got together uh, and, uh, and agreed on an arrangement for, uh, for polar fishing, or, or rather non-polar fishing. And I thought, I think that, uh, and our government has made that point to the other five governments that there was no need to exclude Iceland uh, when it comes to this, and I think we should have been included, and we would still like to be included. And I'm sure there will be a, there are ways to, to, to work that out. 
and I'm sure that also applies to the other two Arctic countries that were not uh, included in this uh, agreement. So let me, uh, let me stop here, James, and, and uh, j just maybe as a general point, I'd like to say that Arctic issues have for a long time been of great interest to the people of Iceland, to the academic community, and to people in politics. Our parliament passed a resolution uh, a few years ago, uh, unanimously, uh, outlining an Arctic policy for the government. <coughs> And there have been uh, Arctic institutions operating in Iceland, in the north, for example, in Akureyri, CAF and PAME, which are offshoots of the Arctic Council, are both located in at uh, the University of Akureyri, and so was the uh, Wilhelm Stefansson Arctic Institute, and of course he was a, a Canadian uh, Arctic explorer of Icelandic origin. So let me leave it here. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, a little bit more about Isaac. Um, I've known Isaac for about 15 years. Um, I used to be a U.S. Senate staffer before I came to the Heritage Foundation, and um, my boss, Senator Nighthorse Campbell, um, had two chairmen that he uh, had to say were his bosses, uh, the chairman, and it was Senator Frank Murkowski of, of Alaska, and then Ted Stevens, who was chairman of the uh, Appropriations Committee. So I got to know Isaac from those days, and then we kind of weren't in that much communication until this Arctic stuff started to come back together. And so even though I'm from Colorado, I think I uh, I'm really uh, appreciate the importance of the Arctic, and I'm happy to help provide a, a venue and a discussion where Isaac, on behalf of Senator Murkowski, can uh, share some perspectives from Alaska. Isaac. Thank you, James, and thanks for the opportunity to be here, and good afternoon to everyone. I want to start a little bit following up on the ambassador's comments that the infrastructure that Iceland already has, you don't see that infrastructure in places like Alaska, um, the Canadian Arctic, Greenland, parts of Russia, uh, but you do see it in, in, in Iceland and Norway, Finland, Sweden. So, so there really are kind of two different Arctics, if you will, in terms of infrastructure development and what's available for the people to use, to use for economic activity, for search and rescue activity, for uh, environmental stewardship, that, that type of a thing. So there's still quite a bit of ways to go, uh, at least from the U.S. perspective, on what we need to do to get to the same level as what some of the other countries already have. And when you look at how do you get there, one of the things that we've been working on, uh, at least Senator Murkowski has been trying to, to work on, is institutionalizing Arctic policy within the government, uh, both within Congress and within the administration, so that it, it lasts, uh, the priority of it lasts beyond just the U.S. chairmanship of the Arctic Council. And once 2017 comes, uh, you're going to have a new administration. You're going to have new people in, in, in charge, and we need to make sure that they, they view the Arctic as being just as important um, as, as it's being looked at today. And we don't know how long. Hopefully, Admiral Papp will be with us for a very long time. But I'm sure he is uh, ready to go on to, to retirement at some point in his life. But uh, we'll we'll keep him for as long as he's willing to to, to be with us. But uh, you, you need to have uh, the future leaders invested in it as well. So that's that's part of the effort uh, that that we're, we're looking to make um, for for Arctic investment strategy. And then when you look at the uh, the Alaska infrastructure that's up in the Arctic, you really need to start with the basic building blocks from uh, aids to navigation, charts, um, to, to icebreakers, you know, how do you get around that type of thing? It, it's not there and we need, to, we need to get put it up there. One potential way of doing that in these times of difficult budgets, for local, state, and federal budgets, is uh, public-private partnerships. How do you let uh, the private industry, how do you let international investors come in and work with you to build ports, to to help uh, put that infrastructure into place when the government isn't going to have the money to do all that. And and that is one thing that the when the Army Corps was looking at the, uh, the various uh, deep draft ports and they, they settled on Nome as their first selection, um, there was a, an amendment within the 2014 Word of Bill, the Water Resources Development Act, that allowed for partnerships between the, the Army Corps and public entities at that point in time, but it allowed for local public entities to partner with the Army Corps to, to make that happen. And uh, we're looking at how do you expand that to allow the private entities to also participate in that. 
So I'll just throw that out there for, for some discussion. Yeah, thank you. Luke? <clears throat> Thanks. Um, former U.S. Secretary of State William Seward, uh, as he approached the end of his life, was asked what was his greatest accomplishment. And he responded back saying that his greatest accomplishment was the purchase of Alaska, but it's going to take at least a generation for Americans to realize it. And I think we could actually say uh, it's taken probably more than a single generation. We're probably about seven or eight generations on from his, from his uh, time when he purchased Alaska and made the United States an Arctic power in 1867. Now, I would like to focus a lot of my comments shifting a bit on the security aspect. Now, of course, the Arctic Council um, doesn't have security under its remit, but you can't really have a discussion about the Arctic and the future of the Arctic and the challenges in the Arctic without discussing some of the security factors. Nor can you have a discussion about Arctic security without discussing Russia. Um, I have, uh, of course, no doubt that R Russian officials at the official level working in the Arctic Council or, um, or exchanges among the Duma and, and uh, various legislative bodies in the various Arctic countries have good relations. Um, but unfortunately, uh, Russia is really controlled at the top by the Kremlin, and I think that, and I suspect that uh, the Kremlin will use uh, a forum like the Arctic Council to drive an agenda, which is unfortunate because the Arctic is one area where the U.S., the West, and Russia should and could, and actually still do to a limited extent, cooperate. And when you travel in Europe to various Arctic countries and you speak to members of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in some countries, you get one story about Russia. When you speak to the Ministries of Defense, you get quite another. So this why I'll focus a little bit about Russia and the security dynamics in the Arctic. With Russia, I believe there are three issues that really drive Russian policy in the Arctic region. First one is this, um, this Putin's vision of Russia's role in the world, right? Often with, we, we hear commentators um, describe Russia's behavior today as being Cold War Russia. Um, we hear this, what Russia's doing in Ukraine, for example, is this Soviet-style behavior. And actually, I think that's wrong. I think what we see today with Russia's imperial behavior, this is how imperial Russia behaved during the time of the Tsar. This is how Russia behaved um, before the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution. Basically, we have a, a 21st century Russia with 18th and 19th century ambitions. And I think that drives a lot of Putin's policies towards the Arctic because the Arctic, harking back to the days of you know, Peter the Great and the Great Northern Expeditions, the Arctic is a way to rally the public around the flag, make the country, allow the country to be proud about something, but have very, with very low risk and low costs um, because, the Arct because they have half of the world's Arctic territory inside their national borders. They can get away with doing, doing certain things that might look like saber rattling, but really at the end of the day, they're perfectly um, allowed to do inside their, their own borders. The second is the economic factor. We've all heard various figures about how, how much undiscovered oil and gas is in the Arctic region. And I'm not gonna bore you with a bunch of facts and statistics. Let's just agree that it's a, probably a lot and of that, probably a lot, uh, about 80% is in Russia's area. So they stand a lot um, to, to gain there. Uh, already, Russia has plans over the next few years to invest $3.8 billion, with a B, billion dollars in the Arctic region. This is the equivalent of Eatria's GDP. And uh, public financing of this is going to account for about 70% of it. And again, this, hark, this goes back to the Great Northern Expedition when, in, when uh, in 1724, Russia spent one-sixth of its uh, state budget on that mission to Kamchatka, which was one of the world's, still is one of the world's largest scientific expeditions in history. And then you hear a lot about the Northern Sea Route. And I think Russia stands again quite a bit with this. Um, simply because the fees are so high to use icebreakers to, to, to transit the route from end to end. But I think also this is slightly overblown a bit. Um, to give you an example, in, in 2013, uh, 71 ships transited the Northern Sea Route above Russia. Last year, 23 transited. Um, the Suez Canal saw 17,000 ships transited last year. So we're, we're, we're a bit off, um, I would say, from, 
from the point where the northern sea route becomes economically viable. And in fact, actually, we forget how big of a place Asia actually is. And although cutting a, a journey from Rotterdam in, in the Netherlands to Yokohama in Japan is 30% shorter, that same journey from Rotterdam to Shanghai in China is only 8% shorter, uh, considering when you use the Suez Canal. And w considering all the risk and everything else associated with transiting the Northern Sea Route, I, I think it's gonna be a long time before companies and businesses start viewing this a as an option. Um, and Russia is doing a lot to militarize the Arctic. New Arctic brigades, new Arctic command structure. The, the Russian Northern Fleet is the largest naval fleet in the Russian Navy. The commander is the best paid commander, best paid admiral in, in, in the Russian Navy. I don't know if Admiral Pep could say that he was the, he was the best paid admiral when he was in, in the Coast Guard. But in fact, the, the, the commander of the Northern Fleet actually earns more than the Russian Defense Minister. Um, the FSB is doing more in the region. There are more training exercises in the region. They've, they're modernizing, uh, updating, or building um, dozens of new bases along the Northern Sea Route. So they are doing a lot in terms of the militariz militarization of the Arctic. And really, what they do inside their national borders is their prerogative, it's their business. But when you, hide, when you compare this to what Russia is doing in other places around the world, South Ossetia, Abkhazia, the Donbas, Luhansk, Donetsk, Crimea, Transnistria, then we start questioning what Russia might do and what their true motives really are. And a lot of this military equipment is dual use, for sure, as we heard from previous speakers about the difficulties and the challenges of just you know, search and rescue in the region. But I think we, it's worth keeping an eye on what Russia is doing in terms of the military in the high north. So what's our response to this? What's NATO's response? Well, NATO as an alliance is, and I'll conclude here, James, mm -hmm. NATO as an alliance is divided on the issue of the Arctic. Um, in the 2010 strategic concept, which was the last strategic concept published by the alliance, which was branded as being the strategic concept that's going to prepare NATO for future challenges such as cyber and energy security, the word Arctic is literally not found in that document. Um, every subsequent summit declaration since 2010, you cannot find the word Arctic. And that's because there's internal division inside NATO primarily between Canada and Norway. Norway would like NATO to play more of a role in the Arctic security. Canada says, no, we need to keep this at the nation state level. We can handle this. And until this resolved, until this is resolved, NATO really isn't going to play an active role, which is unfortunate because at the end of the day, NATO is responsible for the security and defense of a lot of territory that's above the Arctic Circle. Um, in the Arctic, sovereignty equals security, and that means respecting other sovereignty, and that means being able to defend your own sovereignty. And I feel that um, the, the U.S. and some of our partners in Europe are, are far away from being able to fulfill that requirement. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Luke. So before we go to questions or perspectives from the audience, I was wondering if Ambassador Hardy or Isaac would like to have any reflections on what Luke said? Just because I don't want you guys to feel like you're bookend by heritage, you know, on each side. <laughs> it's like... Well, um, the question of Russia in this context is very complicated. Uh, our view has been that in spite of all the differences that we may have with Russia and the problems what we have in our bilateral relationship as a result of, of uh, what has happened in uh, Crimea and the Ukraine, our basic view has been uh, let's not mix the drinks. In other words, let's keep Arctic issues separate, see if we can cooperate and do some good stuff together there. And it seems to me that if you are working on Arctic issues, it, it would be completely pointless to leave out the biggest Arctic country, uh, Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's, it, it, it becomes a, an exercise in futility if, you, if they're not included. Isaac, you, you can take a pass if you want to. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just say that when it comes to relations with Russia, I would say the Arctic issues is probably one area that there has been a reasonable level of cooperation um, and discourse between uh, at least Alaska, Alaska and their Russian counterparts. So it's, it is a clearly an area that there is potential for um, building that relationship back up. So as I look around the audience, I'm seeing people here from several embassies, including different member states of the Arctic Council and observer states. So 
I'm not going to put anybody on the spot, but if there would be any other, other perspectives from other countries, they'd be welcome too. So we got the microphones going around, and, and please identify yourself if you have a question. Okay. Um, Nothing we said was controversial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. Hi, my name is Joran Littell. I am the DCM at the Swedish Embassy. Thank you for arranging this seminar today. Um, thank you, Admiral Papp, and also in the panel. Um, just as was said by the Icelandic ambassador, um, the, the Arctic Council consists of eight member countries. And I think from a Swedish perspective and from all eight perspectives, I think it's, it's crucial that all eight legs of this eight-legged horse really continues to, to participate in the cooperation. The Arctic is a low tension area so far in a way. I hear what you're saying, Coffee, and I've been posted to Russia as well, and, and, is, and I'm following it. And, and I think we all agree that there should be no tolerance to, towards their aggressive behaviors in, in other parts of the world. But as long as we can maintain a, a good and well-balanced uh, cooperation within the Arctic, it, it is, it, it's really a major uh, interest to all of us. So it would be interesting to hear what conclusions you draw from it. I think we all see the signs, but what conclusions and proposals do you see? Um, also regarding the, the awareness uh, within the, the United States, Sweden fully supports the US presidency within the Arctic Council. We think uh, that the priorities are um, highly relevant, and uh, we look forward to the meeting in Anchorage in a couple of weeks. Um, in order to maintain an awareness, I know that you work hard within within Congress as well, and earlier today, Mr. Edwards was talking about the, the Arctic Caucus that now has 10 members, I understand. It would be, would be interesting to hear which parts of the U.S. these members come from and what you think about the future of the Arctic Caucus as well. Thank you. Um, to address your point, yeah, we're lucky that the Arctic remains an area of, of low stability, or a lot of strong stability and low conflict. Um, but in the same way we look towards the future about some of the economic challenges and possibilities, we have to look uh, at the future as some of the security challenges and how we can best prepare for them. Because many of the capabilities that we will need to operate in this harsh environment can't just be purchased off the shelf. And they're, they're long lead items that take years to, um, to generate and, and bring into the, into the force. And we have to be prepared for this. Um, the Arctic, if there's a silver lining to this, it's that the the Arctic does offer an area of, of confidence building between the West and Russia. But, you know, we should be realistic about this. Putin has a certain vision of his role in the world, and the Arctic is another region where he has another lever to pull. And he will pull it when it's convenient for him, not when it, it's convenient for us. So I think we just should be aware of that and be, um, be realistic. But as, as long as Russia continues doing what it's doing in terms of its uh, militarization in the Arctic region inside its national borders, frankly, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just when you, when you examine what they're doing in light of their actions outside their borders in other regions of the world, that's when we should be concerned. Any comments on Arctic uh, caucus? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say that it's, it's actually been a very broad and diverse um, uh, representative of, of the Senate as a whole. Um, members from the south, members from, from of course, the east coast, west coast. Uh, not surprising that the Alaska delegation is, is included there, but uh, members who you would generally think um, their interests lie in um, not just being from, from Arctic matters, but also energy issues, uh, environmental issues, and national security issues as well. So very broad uh, representative of that along those lines. So while I'm no longer um, a Senate staffer, I do want to say that that's great to get that kind of movement going on the Arctic Caucus, because one of the challenges we have in the United States is that since Alaska is physically detached from the rest of the United States, most Americans don't understand that we're an Arctic nation. Um, so getting senators from the other, um, especially with the event called the Lower 48, to understand and appreciate the Arctic is important to, to underscore to the American people that the Arctic is in a national interest 
And as it's a national interest, like we need to get national infrastructure up there and ability to be there. That includes infrastructure or even icebreakers. And that an icebreaker is not an earmark for any given state because that is in the national interest for us to be able to be up there and do stuff. So I, I applaud Isaac for the, the work on the Arctic Caucus. Other thoughts, perspectives? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's actually not a question, it's a commentary to uh, coffee. I, I have a background as a Sovietologist and a correspondent to Russia, and I have been following security at the last NATO summits. Uh, I think in Norway, the mood is very different from what you describe is your mood, your mental, mental state, so to speak. It's, it's like, uh, if you talk privately to military people in Norway, they would still say, yeah, there are uh, this, the Russian politics in Crimea. Uh, in uh, in Ukraine is unex totally unacceptable, of course, but they don't really feel that's an alternative, that uh, <coughs> Russia has uh, expansionist intentions with regard to Norwegian territory or or the Arctic. <coughs> it's it's just as much a question about denying other powers uh, to get too much control, uh, and and um, I think. Um, also, the experience, Norwegian experience with the, the agreement with Russia in 2010 on the continental shelf, we had that agreement, uh, and as well, uh, Russia and uh, abstaining from developing its oil resources, oil and gas resources at the big stockman field in the Barents Sea because it wasn't financially viable. Uh, so uh, it's not like it's maximizing uh, all all the time and. And I think that the, the, the modernization, military modernization, lots of it can be explained by the fact that uh, they, were so, they were falling so far behind during Yeltsin years. Uh, and uh, it's a natural thing. They are still using far less of their uh, GNP on military compared to um, US, for instance. So, and, and I'm just trying to describe the mood, in Norway at least, uh, not you wouldn't find, find many people who feel really that Russia is threatening in that uh, part of the world. Mm -hmm. Another question is in the core areas where Russia f thinks it's, it has its core interests, like Ukraine and, and Crimea. That's a different story. Sure. Um, perhaps you misunderstood if, if you thought that I suggested that <laughs> Norwegians felt um, under some sort of direct threat by by Russia, or if Russia had any sort of territorial ambitions against Norway or any other Arctic power, or sovereign power for that matter, I, I I don't think I suggested that. And I certainly, if I if I did, I didn't mean it. Um, what I'm saying is that uh, in in Norway specifically, there there is a is one of the countries where I find the starkest divide between speaking to members of the MFA and members of the MOD um, on how to deal with the region and how to deal with the uh, with Russia and the Arctic. And it, but no one talks about going to war with Russia, but everyone talks about the best ways to improve security. And sometimes that is you can cooperate with Russia to improve security. And Norway has a great track record of this, having the shared border with Russia. One of only two countries during the Cold War that actually shared a land border with the Soviet Union. The 2010 agreement on the maritime border was a great example of how problems in the 21st century can be solved the old fashioned way by bilateral negotiation cooperations where you don't need multilateral intergovernmental institutions to help solve problems. It's a great example. Yeah. But I was at the summit in 2010 in NATO where I, I saw this debate about the role of Arctic between Canada and, and Norway and, and Lisbon, and it was, it was real. Good. Well, thank you to try to wrap this up. I know we've gone a little bit over time. I get, if Isaac would like to have a last chance for last word, then Ambassador. Hardy, after? Well, I just wanted to say, <clears throat> in, uh, in relation to what you said about the, the maritime agreement between the Soviet Union, uh, Russia and, and um, Norway, it was an exemplary case, uh, you know, doing things the old-fashioned way, even if it takes 50 years yeah. or 70 years or whatever it took. They worked it out yep. in, in a peaceful manner. It was, uh, it was admirable, admirable and to be welcomed by, by all peace-loving nations. I just want to say thanks mm -hmm. again, James, to all of you here for organizing this event. Mm -hmm.
See you, Ralph. Yeah, thank you. And I want to thank Luke Coffey, Isaac Edwards, and Ambassador Hardy, and especially Admiral Papp for being here today. So thank you very much.